Hello and welcome back to our analysis of adiabatic flame temperature. Today we're going to continue on our example from last class, uh, which where we um, did an analytical derivation um, of the adiabatic flame temperature in the example of octane and air. That was the example that we used to, to develop the method. And if you'll recall, we had an entire um, list of tables of values that we ended up interpolating on, and we're going to retake that using a slightly different method today. Here's our problem again. Um, so we have in a, uh, a stoichiometric mixture of air with octane. Uh, and uh, last class in the example, we didn't bother uh, uh, explaining how we found out those coefficients of, for the products N1 and 2 and N3. So today I thought we'd start off by doing the analysis for each one of them. Uh, and basically what we're doing is we're balancing each of the species on the left, the reactants, to those on the right. So in the case of carbon, we have eight atoms of carbon for one k mole of, of octane and so since we only have uh, one C's on the right hand side of the products that must mean that N2 is equal to 8 as well. Next if we do the balance on nitrogen, nitrogen atoms, we add them all up on the left hand side which gives us um, 47 times 2 and on the right hand side we have N3 times 2 which gives us N3 being 47. Finally for hydrogen doing the same thing we end up with N1 equals 9. And that's how we get our three um, our three coefficients on the right. Uh, since we have four atoms, we can verify that these actually are, are balanced on our fourth one as well as they should. And oxygen demonstrates that. So our balanced reaction for stoichiometric combustion of octane in air is as such right here, that's boxed. So this is this is the our starting point for the adiabatic flame temperature analysis. We're basically going to equate the enthalpy of the reactants to that of the products as we saw last time in oh, two classes ago in the general method um, and last class as we applied specifically to this example um, since our reactants are coming in at 25 degrees there which is the same as the reference state the change in enthalpy from the reference state to where they're at is going to be zero and so we're only left with the enthalpy of formation of the reactants in the product and the change in enthalpy of the products to get us to the adiabatic flame temperature. The whole point here is to find this adiabatic flame temperature on the left hand side, but we're going to take advantage of this to verify the enthalpy of formation of octane, CO2 gas, and H2O gas, uh, which should give us values very similar to what we did last time using the book values. And using the book values last time, uh, we ended up with this short little table here for the adiabatic temperature. Uh, at being somewhere between 2350 and 2400 Kelvin, interpolating on that to match the right hand side value, we ended up with 2395 Kelvin. So we're repeating the whole thing here in ease. So starting up ease, uh, let's write a little preamble here to explain what we're doing for our problem. So we are um, calculating the diabetic flame temperature of an octane in air at stoichiometry. And uh, we're going to see how close we can get to the 2395 Kelvin that we got before. So this video we're going to do three different methods. Um, of course any of the three methods would be acceptable, but I want to show that there's some flexibility here in how we need to, we're going to do that. The method one is exactly the same method as we did in the previous example, except that now we're going to use the computer to give us those enthalpies of formation and change in enthalpies at different guest temperature. So, um, first, as we said, we're going to verify whether or not the enthalpies of formation that we got in the book were actually, actually matched those of ease, and so we're going to make a call to the enthalpy of formation function for each of those species, um, octane, nitrogen, and oxygen. Nitrogen and oxygen, we expect that to be zero, of course. Note that we have a problem with water. Uh, water, uh, by default, if we ask for the enthalpy of formation uh, at 295, it's going to give us the enthalpy formation of liquid water, and what we want is the gas, so we made a little change there to accommodate that. So, in order to figure out what the enthalpy of water vapor is at 295 um, degrees Kelvin, we'll end up using the enthalpy function for an ideal gas instead of the enthalpy formation for the substance H2O at um, its natural state, which would be liquid at that same temperature. So that's what you, why you see two calls there 
to um, the um, to find the enthalpy of formation of water, I want to illustrate that there's a difference between the formation of liquid and the enthalpy of vapor. The difference, of course, between the two of them being the latent heat of evaporation of water at that temperature. Okay. So next, we're actually going to go ahead and calculate the right hand side using the exact same method that we did last time which is taking the sum of the enthalpies of formation of the reactants and subtracting the enthalpy of formation of the products from that and that's our whole right hand side and for the left hand side just like we did last last time we're going to have a, an array of guest adiabatic flame temperatures and at each of those guest temperature we're going to calculate the uh, change in enthalpy required um, for each of these um, each of these species and we're going to call that left hand side that's what we got here push the button calculate it and we've got a whole bunch of unit problems that we're going to um, fix first before we do anything else um, basically because we have so many variables we can, we've got to uh, make sure that the units are properly specified it's a great way to verify um, whether or not we've made a mistake, a fundamental mistake in the way that we've set things up. And the first thing we should do is make sure that the unit system is correct. Since we're doing a chemical analysis of combustion here, let's make sure everything is in moles. The beauty with ease is that it's going to scream at us if we make a mistake here as we uh, force the, force the uh, units on the variable information um, window here. So for delta enthalpies, it's going to be a change in enthalpies per unit mole so it's going to be kilojoules per k mole for uh same with specific enthalpies it's on a molar basis all over here so we've got a whole bunch of those and I'm simply highlight, highlighting them all until so we finally tag the enthalpy and multiply it a specific enthalpy multiplied by number of moles where we're finally going to recover the uh, energy itself in kilojoules and that's what we've got right here and c8 h18 etc those are just number of moles right hand side should be in kilojoules and the entropies uh, which is a byproduct of some of the calls that we're going to be making are in joules per k mole k and while our units are all um, reconciled we're in good shape um, let's bring back our OneNote window so we can attach everything there together and compare the values that we've got and the values are all pretty uh, close to actually what the book had as you would hope to have the only one that's slightly different is that for water and so there's you know different models for calculating the enthalpy of formation of water and uh, we have a slight difference between uh, the two the two methods but as you see here in our final analysis uh, let's see you know we it's not doesn't make a very 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 big difference at the end of the day now we did get one error um, not error but a warning the warning was due to the fact that uh, we're pushing uh, the calculation slightly beyond the range of temperatures that's allowed here um, for some of these enthalpy calculations. The temperature that ease allows is up to 3500K. And here on my array of guest temperatures, I went all the way to 6000. You'll see that in a moment here while I'm doing this because uh, I want to show that there's another method that we can find enthalpies at slightly higher temperatures. Than the method that, that we've shown here in method one. So uh, the right hand side as a result of this difference in the enthalpy of formation of water uh, is slightly lower than it was in the book method. Um, so that, that accounts for the entire difference on the right hand side of about 9,000 uh, kilojoules out of 5 million. So it's you know for this sort of thing it's actually pretty pretty good. Um, taking the values that we got then for the left hand side with our own ease calculated value, we can interpolate between 2350 and 2400 um, using the simple interpolation method that you've used you know, all along in, in thermal one primarily. That's all I'm repeating here, which is what we did actually in the previous class using the book method. So it's the lower temperature plus the change in enthalpies from where we're at to the lower enthalpy multiplied by the change in temperature divided by the total change in enthalpy and the values that I have. You put all that together and you get 2388K for this ease method of looking up the values, which I believe, we, I, I, I think you should take advantage of um, compared to taking book values at this point in your career. So we're looking at a difference of 7K 
out of 2,000 K for an antibiotic antibiotic method. I think that illustrates that method works very, very well. Um, either way, uh, it's, it's very accurate. Um, however, the, a better way of doing it, as I just flashed there, is to cat use ease all together to do this last interpolation step. And I'm going to call that method two. This is really the, at least the method that I, I think you should take away from all this. Let ease do the heavy lifting for you. So instead of making an array of table here, um, we're going to force A to intrinsically find the diabetic flame temperature. So I'm not going to erase the previous stuff that we have there. I'm simply going to pen to the previous uh, um, method that we've established, and I'm going to you know, add some steps to do it. So the left-hand side of method two, uh, when all is said and done with the intrinsic value, should be equal to the same right-hand side that we had before. So I'm going to keep calling that right-hand side method one. So uh, the right-hand side of method one is uh, was defined before, but now the left-hand side of method two is the actual enthalpies that we're, we're going to have at TADIAB2, which is my TADIAB method 2, which is the um, value that we're going to send in the function itself to match the right-hand side exactly. So as you see here, I've done that, and boom, off it went. And we ended up with an adiabatic temperature of 1 degree Kelvin. So that is a problem, right? And it's a problem because these functions um, are not intrinsically linear. So first, let's fix back the unit problem that we have, just to make sure that E doesn't, doesn't bark at us for a potential error in units. I mean, the, the numerical values are unchanged here, but it, it's a way to verify that you're understanding the dimension dimensional analysis of the problem. Now, for this adiabatic method 2 range, this is where a problem has, because our, our or values or functions that are calling are not perfectly linear, we're going to bracket the range within our independent variable, a ta dia method 2, uh, to be closer to what we know has to be the adiabatic flame temperature. So, so it's got to be more than 1,000 degrees, right? And it's going to be less than 10,000 degrees. So this shortens the range quite a bit and should get us in a better ballpark. Let's try it. Okay, so now we don't have any errors as before. It goes pretty quick. We still have our out of range problems, uh, but there is no unit problems anymore. And lo and behold, look at that. Straight off the bat, we got the adiabatic flame temperature come, came right out of ease without us having to do anything else. So, method two should really be your fallback method, I think, for uh, these types of problems. Uh, and pay special attention to narrowing the range of. Uh, of available temperature for the uh, intrinsic variable. Uh, otherwise, ease might converge, as it did here in the first case, uh, to a solution that is not uh, real. Okay, we're going to put that into our OneNote uh, record of our analyses here, and we're going to keep going with the third method that I want you to um, be aware of. This is what, one that I use all the time in my engines class where instead of calculating these enthalpies of formations of products and reactants on the right-hand side, we simply use what's called the lower heating value, and we've talked about this in the course. Uh, basically, it's the amount of energy or heat released by the combustion of a fixed amount of fuel. Um, so in this case, we're going to use the lower heating value of octane on a molar basis, and we're going to set that equal to a right-hand side, and we're going to use the intrinsic method of method two to calculate the left-hand side of our adiabatic um, energy equation and see where we go from there. So let's paste something that's going to first establish the right-hand side as being that lower heating value, and we're using these function lower heating value with parameter CADH18. It should spit us out a value because of our units in kilojoules per k-mole. Uh, and since I'm more aware of the value of octane in mass, I'm making a quick conversion here to just verify it should be around 44,000 kilojoules per kg. We'll see what ease gives us. Okay, and I've just copied the block from um, method 2 and changed the name of the variable to TADIA3, uh, and that's it. But again, we've got that same problem as before, which gives us a, name, a flame temperature at default of 1. Makes no sense. So we'll bracket, we'll fix our, our unit problems, and we'll bracket that 
uh, adiabatic flame temperature for method three to be within a more reasonable range. And just to show you that the, the actual range itself is not uh, super important. By default, ease wants to go from minus infinity to plus infinity, and of course, temperature can be negative. Uh, but now we'll uh, put a slightly different value, say a bigger range, let's say 500 to again 10,000 Kelvin, and see what that gives us. And boom, it converts right away, no problem. Uh, uh, we're within four degrees uh, Kelvin of our previous method. So that shows you how um, this method, which is quite a bit easier than the previous one, uh, gives us a, a very, very accurate result as well. So I encourage you to pay attention to this. This is a fantastic way for estimating the end temperature of combustion products, simply using one well-tabulated parameter, um, the, that of the lower heating value of, of a fuel uh, that's being burnt. Um, couple that with a, a CP times delta T method for calculating the change in enthalpy, and you can imagine that you get a very powerful way of solving these types of problems. Well, that's it. We are done. I hope that uh, you enjoyed this uh, video and uh, got some insight on how to calculate adiabatic flame temperature. Thank you.